So today we'll try something a little bit different yet again. I got David Brown with me. He just finished a pretty interesting, I think, research paper with STI. He's an STI graduate student and uh, he wrote about preventing and detecting living off the land attacks, certainly a hot topic. So David, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, so my name is David Brown. Um, happy to be with you here today. So I just um, recently finished my last course with the Sands Technology Institute, so uh, on my way towards graduating, so uh, it's a very fulfilling program. Um, I manage IT for a private foundation, so it's a little bit about my, my background. So living off the land attacks at SCOTUS is always talking about this, and he mentioned it uh, this year as part of uh, the talk that we did at RSA. Hard to detect, or uh, because you always have to deal with binaries that are actually normal and on the system. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so living off the land attacks um, are growing and they're becoming more and more prevalent. So basically, attackers have figured out why put why download malware to your machine when we can just directly use built-in Windows applications to to advance the attack and to compromise your network. So attackers are, are getting smarter about this. They're basically saying, hey, you know, uh, antivirus providers are not going to flag uh, PowerShell as malicious, right? Or, um, or MSHTA, these built-in Windows tools are not going to flag them as malicious. So why don't we use these tools? Um, some of the new behavioral-based uh, antivirus, you know, like Windows ATP, uh, Defender ATP, have gotten better at spotting some of these attacks because they're not just looking at the underlying application, but they're looking how those applications are behaving. But this is still a very big deal, and uh, we have a long ways to go before we're totally secure against these living off the land attacks. Yeah, so one tool that comes to mind here is Bits Admin, or it's a valid tool that Windows needs to download updates, but the bad guys are also often using it to download malware, and that's, of course, hard to detect. So I really took yeah, the so premise of how can a defender um, thwart these attacks that are becoming more and more prevalent? How can we detect them, and how can we differentiate them between normal administrative use of the applications versus malicious use? And is there a way to separate them out to allow the administrators and the underlying Windows operating system to use the tools, but then stop the attackers from using them and also alert when the attackers try to use them. So that was kind of the goal of the research. So I think you got a demo for us uh, to actually show us uh, how this works in real life. All right, so I have a virtual machine uh, here. I'm just using VMware Fusion, but basically it's what I did on this virtual machine was I I created three different users. So one user is kind of what you would call a, uh, a regular user. There's no app locker, nothing. They're just, you know, regular user based on, you know, how Windows kind of comes out of the box um, and how they would be exposed to the various living off the land attacks. Um, there's another user who has the default app locker rules enabled. And for those of you who aren't familiar, so AppLocker is Microsoft's built-in application whitelisting tool. And basically, they have default rules that you can turn on, which trust certain things and, and don't trust other things. Um, but by default, as you would imagine, uh, Microsoft's products that are in the Windows directory and program uh, files directory are trusted. Um, this is the case with a lot of application whitelisting deployments where Microsoft products will just be trusted. And thus, the living off the land attacks are able to take place because these tools are needed for administrators or needed for the operating system. Um, and attackers know that. So then the third user that I set up on this virtual machine is one where we turned, I turned on application whitelisting rules but made them user aware. So basically... It knows if, if the operating system or an administrator is trying to use this tool versus a regular user. And I kind of operate under the premise of the attacker is going to uh, be attacking in the context of the regular user who's, who's opening that attachment or browsing that website. And so if we can block that attack um, and alert that something is actually taking place, then the defender can, uh, can be aware and also intervene. 
So, so AppLocker understands who is using a tool, but doesn't restrict what you're doing with the tool. So, yep, so it's sort of a so yes, no kind of thing. You got it. So based on who is using the tool, it can make different decisions on what to yeah. do uh, and whether to generate alerts or whether to block it outright or whatnot. Um, so the first one I'll do uh, no app locker. So this is the user who doesn't have app locker uh, enabled. So let's go ahead and pop into this virtual machine. So in my research paper, um, which I would encourage you to, to look up, it's called preventing living off the land attacks. And I go into a number of different attacks uh, for living off the land. I could have used hundreds of different attacks. Um, I narrowed it down to three primary categories in the paper. Uh, but the living off the land attack rules that I created in AppLocker are meant to cover a, a very wide range of living off the land attacks. So let's go ahead and do just a simple attack here. So one attack that we've seen out in the wild is when attackers will email or get someone to download an HTA file. So uh, HTA files run, when you double click on it, it executes a trusted Windows program in the background. Um, and this, this simple one here basically just launches PowerShell and begins pinging uh, the internal host. An attacker wouldn't do that, but if you're in an, an environment, you can imagine that if one of your users downloads this HTA file and executes it, um, and then any PowerShell command can then run in the background, um, you know that's kind of what defenders want to protect against. So as the regular user with no app locker, uh, when I launch it, you can see that uh, no problem, it, it launched PowerShell, it's, it's pinging the internal host. Um, it's already a proof of concept here to see that you absolutely. can execute code. Yeah. Yeah, and in my paper, I go through some more malicious examples than just pinging the malicious host. I go through some privilege escalation examples um, and various things like that. Um, just for, for purposes of this, uh, I just chose some simpler attacks to kind of show. Um, when you turn on the default app locker rules, let's go ahead and log in as that user. So again, we're gonna we're gonna use that same same exploit code. So assuming that the user downloads or is emailed an HTA file. So again, with the default app locker rules in place, again, no problem executing. An uh, interesting thing about this is the default app locker rules are supposed to stop um, unknown script execution. And you can see that I just executed a script. Um, through PowerShell um, that you would think should be blocked by the default rules that say that they block unknown script execution. But we were able to bypass that by packaging the script into an HTA file. So then if I go on to my user who has the living off the land uh, rules that I created, which are user aware rules designed to prevent living off the land attacks. All right, so here I am on the, uh, as the user who has the living off the land rules enabled. And I'm going to, um, again, just assume this file was downloaded uh, from the internet or emailed, and then the, the user tries to execute that application. So you can see in this instance, yeah. the living off the land uh, rules that I defined within AppLocker since they're user aware they say, hey, a user is trying to execute uh, MSHTA, um, and we're going to block it. Not only does it block it, but then it generates a, a log entry. And if you're watching those logs or sending them off to, yeah. uh, to Splunk or something like that, then you can generate alerts off of those logs. So the defender not only stopped the attack from happening, but, but knows that, um, that a built-in Windows application was potentially uh, misused. So that's kind of yeah, the, cool, yeah. the design behind, behind the research. That's really cool. So the block the attack and alerted the administrator. 
Now, if this user would have administrative privileges, could there still be something done that it doesn't work with run as, or does this assume that the user does not have administrative privileges? Yeah, so the, the whole security behind this is basically trying to operate on the, the best practices that users do not yeah. log in and, and do their daily work as an administrator. If you, if you are an administrator, then you could, you could bypass all of these rules. Now you could have App Locker block these tools for administrators too, but a lot of these tools like run uh, DLL32, um, PowerShell, a lot of these different tools administrators use legitimately. And so you don't actually want to, to block those tools for an administrator because um, it would kind of undermine um, a lot of the functionality of, of Windows. So um, yeah, the, the design definitely hinges on logging in as a regular user and then elevating your permissions if you want to do something as an administrator. Right. Those are the sort of approach escalation attacks probably would be more difficult here or because they often require on running some tool on, on the system. Yeah, exactly. So if you were trying to do a privilege escalation, so getting your tool to run in the context of the regular user, that's what we're trying to stop. So if you're trying to use yeah. PowerShell, for example, to do a privilege escalation attack, well, PowerShell won't run as the regular user, so you can't get the privilege escalation. And then the defender is also alerted that that uh, attack was prevented. So that's cool. I really like it. Uh, real nice work there. Uh, how long did it take you to put everything together to get it to work? Oh, goodness. The, so the rules took a very long time to come up with all the rules, because uh, if, you, if you pull up the, the Lobos, um, Lobos project, or if you pull up um, uh, the Mitre attack framework, there's, there's hundreds of built-in Windows programs that attackers yeah. could use to try to bypass whitelisting, to uh, install ransomware on the machine, to do privilege escalation. And so really I tried to design rules that would focus on all of the known attacks <laughs> and basically yeah. make it to where the user could do anything that the user currently does, which is, you know, download whatever they want and open whatever attachment they receive and try to protect the user from that living off the land attack while still letting the administrator and, and um, Windows operating system do what, do what it needs to do. So That's pretty nice. Uh, do you run these rules currently in a sort of production setup? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, designed the rules and then uh, testing them in multiple environments. Uh, I tested them in audit mode to see what kind of impact they would have on the regular users. And then I tested them in uh, fully deployed deployed mode as well. So well, this is actually nice. Uh, so you can run them in audit mode. So you just get the alerts if yeah. if you're a little bit worried that this guy David there doesn't really know yeah. what he's doing and <laughs> blocks tools that you yeah. may need in your environment. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the 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 coolest things about AppLocker is you can you can set the rules to audit only. And basically then you can see all the activity and all the alerts to say, oh, users are running cmd.exe a lot. And you can kind of investigate, why are they running this a lot? Is it legitimate in my env environment or is, is the program being abused? And so once you get comfortable kind of fine tuning the tools and it's it's a balance, right? You have to, you have to balance how, how tightly am I going to secure the Microsoft binaries versus um, the functionality for the end user and what kind of impact will that have on the user experience? And so um, yeah. audit allows you to strike that right balance. Did you run into any sort of power users that uh, cause false positives that sort of wrote their own little scripts and such to automate certain tasks? Yeah, I, I didn't in the, in the two environments that I was auditing on, but I'm sure, um, in larger environments, I'm sure you would run into all sorts of users who are trying to do neat little things with, with PowerShell or whatever. And um, yeah. you could allow PowerShell for, for that user um, mm -hmm. if you wanted to, or you could just kind of say, hey, I know you love PowerShell, but sorry, we got to <laughs> take it away because it's being abused out in the wild uh, quite yeah, extensively. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, one other yeah. side note on that is, their regular user, you could take away PowerShell, 
And you could give them a second user that has permissions to run some of these tools and they would mm -hmm. just do a run as. So that way, if they accidentally opened an attachment or downloaded something mm -hmm. that tried like an HTA file or whatever that tried to run a malicious script, it would be blocked. But then if they were doing their legitimate work, they would do a run as on, on the trusted um, scripts that they've written or something like that. Yeah, that, that is a good point. Now, I'm going to add URLs to your paper and such. Uh, where can people find the rules? Are they part of the paper, or do you have some references there? Yeah, I put all the rules into the appendix on the paper. So you can okay, implement those rules if you want and start out in yeah. audit mode so that you can kind of see yeah. how, it, how it functions in your environment. So start in audit mode. <laughs> yep. yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this demo. I really liked it. So uh, great work there. And uh, good talking to you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So yeah, let me know what you think about these little videos. We used to have these STI student interviews at the end of the podcast, but with the YouTube and video format, we are able to have these demos included. So uh, let me know if you like it and uh, we hopefully will post more of these videos here to this channel. So just uh, subscribe to it. Thanks and bye.